This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. We start out the newscast from Iraq, which was awakened with more news about violence. In the early hours of the morning, there were news reports about explosions here and there, before the suicide explosion which took place at noon, killing at least 30 people and injuring 100 others. This comes after two suicide bombers blew themselves up outside the two gates of the Shiite shrine in al Khafamiya in Baghdad. Two policemen were killed in separate attacks. One took place in Kirkuk, and the other one took place in Fallujah. Three members of the al Sahwa Council were killed in a suicide explosion in the Diyala province. This new bloody attack comes after one of the bloodiest days in Iraq. The death toll from yesterday's two suicide attacks has reached 87. One of the suicide attacks targeted a restaurant that was crowded with Iranian tourists in al Maqdadiya. The other suicide attack took place in the middle of a crowd of Iraqi police officers in Baghdad. The return of violence to Iraq will without a doubt be a big concern for the new American ambassador to Iraq, Christopher Hill, who was received yesterday by the American president, Barack Obama, according to a White House statement. Christopher Hill will officially begin his mission within days, and he is scheduled to go to Baghdad at the end of next week. Officials from 21 administrative districts in the Iraqi province of Nineveh announced that they will boycott the province's new council after the al Hadba party took control of all the new administrative positions in the province. Nineveh Governor Afil Najifi said that this move is a violation of the law. Al Jazeera correspondent Ahmed Al-Zawiti has more details about the subject in the following report. The geographic features of Mosul, the center of the province of Nineveh in northern Iraq, have been the same for centuries. Every morning the Tigris River quietly runs through the city as a light breeze can be felt in the air. This explains why Iraqis call Mosul the city of the two springs. However, following the Iraqi provincial elections, the administrative process has been fundamentally changed. A new administration has emerged in Mosul that completely differs from all previous administrations. The al Hadba party, headed by Athir al-Najifi, won 19 seats and took over all administrative positions in the new council. This has never happened in any other Iraqi province. The government institutions of the province of Nineveh should not be affected by political parties. Therefore, the results of the election should not affect Nineveh's administrative performance. The Islamic Party of Iraq is the most prominent political force in the city and has a similar political orientation to the al Hadba party, which was made clear when its spokesman in Mosul said that he was relieved by what he called the end of political sectarianism. I believe the elections were good. People voted for national, good and qualified leaders. This is what we worked for. We have managed to rid our country of the political sectarian system which was opposed on us after the occupation. 
However, the administrative positions that are controlled by representatives from the Ninawa Brotherly Kurdish Party, who won 12 seats, refuse to accept the new status quo. Erbil, which is closely watching the new developments in Ninawa, completely supported those who decided to boycott the new council of the province. They demand the implementation of Article 140 of the Iraqi Constitution, which the Kurdish regions of Iraq want to use as a justification to include new areas of Iraq in the Kurdish region. Some of these new areas are from the province of Ninawa, such as the Sinjar, Shekhan, and Mahmur, Ahmad al-Zawidi, al-Jazeera, Erbil. Egyptian and Arab media outlets said that Secretary General of the Arab League, Amr Musa, will go to Beirut next week to discuss the issue of Hezbollah. Meanwhile, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood warned that raising the issue of Hezbollah in this manner will weaken the resistance against Israel. From here in the Egyptian Sinai Desert, supplies were transported to the resistance against colonization. Here the Egyptian army also recorded four of its heroic battles against the Israeli occupation. Now the Egyptian authorities are persecuting the resistance and contributing to the siege that deprives Palestinians of basic life necessities. Those who pass by this area learn that the Egyptian government has been focusing its attacks on the Lebanese resistance of Hezbollah without thinking about the consequences. The Egyptian regime continues to incite and make accusations against the resistance, which paves the way for cooperation with the government of Netanyahu and his foreign minister, who said a few months ago, quote, if Mubarak does not want to talk to us, let him go to hell. Also, he threatened to shell the Great Dam in Aswan and the presidential headquarters in Cairo if Egyptian forces were sent to Sinai. Egyptian and Arab newspapers reported that the Arab League Secretary General Amr Musa will go to Beirut in an attempt to calm the situation that was created against the resistance and its leadership. Musa advised Egyptian officials to back off Hezbollah in order to reach a solution to the problem. The Muslim Brotherhood released a statement saying that raising the issue of Hezbollah in this manner will weaken the resistance against Israel. The Brotherhood said that it supports all forms of aid to the Palestinians. Amidst tight security measures, the detainees were taken to medical facilities to find out if they were subjected to torture. A medical report will be submitted to the Attorney General within days. The Egyptian regime is now making accusations against the resistance, as if Egypt's historical resistance against colonization never existed, leaving many to wonder if Egypt will ever break free from the chains of its peace agreement with Israel. Palestinian and Syrian citizens said that Egypt's campaign against Hezbollah and its secretary general is aimed at weakening the resistance and implementing an American agenda in the region. Egypt has animosity towards Hezbollah and the Palestinian resistance. Egypt closed the Rafah crossing and did not let humanitarian aid pass into Gaza. Mubarak said that he wants to send humanitarian aid to Darfur, but he can't even send humanitarian aid to Gaza next door. I'm surprised by this random campaign that's been launched by Egyptian officials against the resistance in the region. This campaign is particularly aimed to demonstrate good behavior to Western countries, especially the U.S. When the Egyptian regime arrested a Hezbollah cell, it showed that it is going forward with its American Zionist plan in the region. The Egyptian regime shows that it is committed to America's agenda in the region.
human rights groups say Israel is preying on the sick and vulnerable in Gaza to coerce them into spying. Al Jazeera has heard claims that one man died waiting for a permit for medical treatment after he refused to act as an informant for the Israelis. Many fishermen claim they too are being threatened with blackmail, as Eamon Mohyuddin reports now from Gaza. Rafah's pristine coast. It's in these waters generations of Palestinian fishermen have earned a living. And where in recent years, according to the fishermen, Israel has frequently tried to recruit informants inside Gaza. They say they are routinely harassed by the Israeli Navy and detained. Many claim they are subjected to physical abuse and are intimidated into becoming spies. Nearly 300 out of Rafah's 500 fishermen have been detained at one point or another, says the head of the fishermen's syndicate. And several fishermen told Al Jazeera they were asked to spy for Israel. They took us to Ashdod and threatened us into working with them. I'm an old man who doesn't remember much, and I don't know much except how to fish. This fisherman declined to show his face or give his name out of fear, but says Israel has tried to coerce him into becoming an informant on several occasions. He says Israel wants to recruit fishermen to know if and how weapons are smuggled into Gaza through the sea. It's widely believed that Israel maintains a robust system of informants, spies and collaborators across the Gaza Strip, with many being coerced or blackmailed into passing vital information about the activities of Palestinian factions and their leaders. In its recent war on Gaza, Israel killed senior Hamas leader and deposed Minister of Interior Said Siom, despite being at an undisclosed location. According to reports, during the six months truce between Israel and Palestinian factions that preceded the war, Israel intensified its intelligence gathering operations inside Gaza. Saeed Abu Shemela says Israel tried to recruit his sick brother, Khaled, as an informant when he applied for a permit to receive critical medical treatment inside Israel. <laughs> At the time Khalid went to see the Israelis, they said to him, we want you to cooperate with us. He said, I don't know anything and will not work with you. They wanted to know about the resistance and their leaders. Khalid refused to spy for Israel, so his brother believes that's why his permit for medical treatment was rejected. Khalid died last October. Today, his wife and two children survive living off a small grocery store they've opened in his name. Human rights organizations say fishermen and sick patients being treated inside Israel are targeted because they come into direct contact with Israelis and can be coerced because of their vulnerability. This is uh, a serious violation of uh, international humanitarian law. It is a gross violation of human rights because the realization of the right to health in all the territory that is controlled by Israel is um, uh, um, uh, the responsibility of the state of Israel. They want to control Gaza. But so long as Israel maintains its stifling grip and occupation on Gaza, so too will it continue to have the ability to coerce the people of Gaza into spying. Ayman Mohideen Al Jazeera, Gaza. The Iranian news station Al Mahar reported that some places in Tehran which sell fruit have Israeli oranges for sale. The report also stated that it's clear that the oranges which are marked with an Israeli seal entered Iran through one of the well-known importers in Tehran and arrived to the market two days ago. The centers responsible for buying fruits and vegetables in Tehran said that the Israeli oranges that entered Tehran entered through China inside trunks marked with Chinese seals and arrived to customs without difficulty. It is known that all different types of Israeli products, particularly electronic and internet products, find their way to Iranian markets after changing the name of the country's origin to any country in Eastern Asia. Let's talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
uh, you were uh, an extremely influential figure during the Camp David negotiations. Do you think that a two-state solution is possible at this point in time? I think it's not only possible, but it's necessary. It seems to me that if there is not such a solution in the not-too-distant future, the opportunity for that solution may pass. There is settlement activity, which makes a real accommodation more difficult. There are incidents, events, tragic situations, like what happened recently in Gaza, which poisoned the atmosphere. Uh, there is a tendency, in different degrees perhaps, and not yet irrevocable, but there is a tendency on both sides towards more extremist views. So I think time is of the essence. Mm. Uh, but I do think that still it is possible to have a settlement, in part because, according to public opinion polls, both within Israel itself and within Palestine, the majorities are still for settlement. And very interestingly, public opinion polls show that the majority of American Jews who are, as Americans, interested in American policy and try to influence it, the majority, 16 percent, favor a two-state solution. This year's oil, gas and petrochemical exhibition in the Iranian capital, Tehran, shows Iran is doing well in the international arena, despite a new round of U.S. sanctions imposed on Iran back in 2006. On that, we have Leila Faramarzi. Strained political ties may be a reality, but breaking business ties as a result is closer to fantasy, as Iran's 14th international oil and gas exhibition has proven, with participation from over 450 foreign companies, including Total and BP, contrary to expectation. Now uh, there are some LNG projects which are being talked about here in Iran and uh, we would then uh, treat the gas before it gets shipped but we then also get involved in the marine side um, providing equipment on the LNG carriers to be shipped out of the country. LNG being liquefied natural gas. A press conference on gas exports was held at the exhibition with Iran's oil minister as advisor. Countries tend to dodge U.S. dictated sanctions as they need to sell goods to Iran. As an energy-rich country out to implement numerous oil and gas projects worth a total of some $500 billion. We are like a bridge between uh, uh, the man, uh, man, uh, mills manufacturer to the end user in Iran. Kasai Zadeh stressed Iran exports gas only to Turkey and imports from Turkmenistan but is now looking to exporting to Armenia and Switzerland, beginning with 3 million cubic meters of gas daily. Gas exports constituted 80% of Iran's export earnings as of 2008, and Kasai Zadeh says he hopes for gas exports to total 571 million cubic meters a day. Key players in Iran's industry go beyond the Western Middle East. With this new generation of Chinese oil and gas rigs and wheels, we cut down on one to one and a half million dollars cost per year with every transportation. Kasai Zadeh mentioned other visions for Iran, namely that Asaluya Southern Port is to be joined to Europe to transit gas by a single operator, with Iran's Turkish border as the delivery port. Once, just to nationalize Iran's oil and gas industry was a struggle. Today, the country is talking of making further profits off its produce and exports. Leila Faramarzi, Press TV, Tehran. After stopping for several years and as a result of security conditions, the musical group Kura Amakam of the Artists Guild in the province of Ninawa has returned to play their musical pieces in a performance enjoyed by its audience. We go to Arkan Atai.
The goal behind the establishment of Kura al Makam in the Artists Guild in Minawa is to introduce Iraqi folk music, particularly from Mosul, to the new generation of Iraqi youth. The newly established group includes both professionals and amateurs. The goal of this group is to expose Iraqi youth to their heritage and teach them about it, because it has recently begun to disappear and the youth are unaware of their heritage. Old songs and Iraqi musical compositions were performed by this group using classical musical instruments. This was to the liking of the audience, especially when it came to singing the well-known Iraqi songs and in particular songs from Mosul. This is a positive step and a wonderful initiative made by the Department of Musical Artists of this guild. Its goal is to attract capable youth and to develop and polish their talents in terms of their musical potential, performance, and singing. In order to create opportunities and to utilize the energies of this group of rising artists, they will need to receive the support and interest of the concerned Iraqi authorities. They desperately need to create opportunities for the youth, especially after expressing interest in participating in local and international competitions. This group was formed recently, but it plays Iraqi music and music that reflects Mosul's heritage. The new initiative aims to save Mosul's musical heritage despite their modest capabilities and difficult conditions. Still, those in charge insist on achieving their stated objectives. From Mosul, Arkan Tayi, Al Samaria. Nuclear-armed Pakistan is unraveling at a frightening pace. The Taliban want Islamic Sharia law enforced. Is Zardari abdicating to the Taliban? And is Pakistan's nuclear stockpile in danger? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. Speaking at the National Assembly, Pakistan's Prime Minister Sayyid Yusuf Raza Gilani said that the military could stop the Taliban and that the country's nuclear weapons were safe. Does this parliament not have moral courage to stop them, he asked. Pakistan is on a precipice. The Swat Valley, once called the Switzerland of Pakistan for its great natural beauty, is now the Taliban's battleground for Islamic fundamentalism, where harsh Islamic Sharia law is imposed on the population and fully sanctioned by the Pakistani government. In recent days, armed Taliban fighters have set up checkpoints and occupied mosques in Buner region, just 60 miles from Islamabad, declaring Islamic law before retreating after striking a deal with the government. Will Pakistan eventually fall to the Taliban? I think that uh, the Pakistani government is uh, basically abdicating uh, to the Taliban and to the extremists. Uh, but look at why this is happening. If you talk to people in Pakistan, especially in the ungoverned territories, which are increasing in number, they don't believe the state has a judiciary system that works. Parts of the country have already fallen to the Taliban, and attacks inside main cities such as Lahore have been on the rise. The Taliban have also infiltrated into Punjab province and Karachi. But that does not mean that either Pakistan as a whole nor its nuclear stockpile is in danger. 
According to U.S. and Pakistani officials, there is no way a complete nuclear weapon can be taken from Islamabad's stockpile, which is protected by about 10,000 of the Pakistani military's most elite troops. Also, the guts of nuclear warheads are kept separate from the rest of the device, and a nuclear detonation is impossible without both pieces. Additionally, the delivery vehicle, plane or missile, is also segregated from the warhead components. So what are the Taliban after? Their ambitions are no secret. Two prominent clerics have broadcast their intent to spread Islamic rule throughout the country, and they have been taking advantage of grievances against corrupt courts and greedy landlords to win support. We are a peaceful people, and we prefer a peaceful struggle. If they try to stop our struggle, you've seen what's happened in the tribal areas and SWAT. God willing, we have to continue our struggle, and I request that you, the people, try hard to bring Islamic law to the country. Most importantly, they have also been able to capitalize on widespread resentment of the United States, exacerbated by its attacks on militants with missiles launched from pilotless drones. In fact, U.S. attacks on tribal areas in Pakistan have done nothing to reduce the Taliban's influence, but rather have backfired and strengthened it politically and undermining what authority remained to President Asif Ali Zardari. According to U.S. analysts and pundits, in eight short months since coming to office, Zardari has managed to cede large parcels of Pakistan's land to the Taliban, weaken the army, and bankrupt the government. Mr. Zardari, however, blames the instability in Pakistan on the United States and insists that the presence of Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar on Pakistani soil is not his fault. They were pushed into Pakistan by your great military offensive in Afghanistan, he says sarcastically. For seven years nothing has happened and now we are weak and you are unable to do anything about it. I've lost my wife, he adds, my friends and the support of my countrymen, and in eight years you haven't been able to eliminate the cancer. Zardari may have a point there. I'm Jamal Dejani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mir. You can also visit my blog on the Huffington Post. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.